Hello everyone, this is the Range Selector tutorial. This is going to be a long one, so strap in. This is one of the greatest tools that you will use in your editing career. So we're going to stay inside After Effects. Let's get started. I'm using the minimal layout if you wanted to kind of copy what I have on screen, but I'm using the Align panel, I'm using the Properties panel, and I'm going to make sure that we have our Project panel as well. So we have our timeline and what we see in our composition. Let's do Control T or Command-T if you're on Mac, and we're going to type in, do all caps, you are the, enter, best in the biz. All right, do Control-A or Command-A, and then we are going to make sure that it's centered. So if you have the paragraph, you'll see in your properties panel, we're going to center it, and then we're also going to mess the, with the leading, and we're going to put that at 125 pixels. So that's going to bring it down. All right, so before we do anything else, we need to center our anchor point. So right now it looks like it's kind of in the center, but we want to center it. And the way that we can do that is if it is selected in your timeline, we're going to do control alt home and you'll see that it shifted right dead center into our range or our text layer. So let's go ahead and hit the align tool. We'll go up horizontal, vertical, and things are looking good. So before we dive into all of the text animations, I want to talk about the transform settings. So if you go over to your text layer and open it up. We're going to focus on transform first. And I want to talk us through what we're actually seeing and working with within After Effects. Now, if you feel like you need to skip this, please look at the chapters below, but I will urge you to stick around because you might learn something. So let's go ahead and go through these. We have an anchor point. This point is this little centered crosshair right here. We have position. Right now it's telling us it is 540 and 960. So a lot of us know that this is the X and Y coordinates. You can also right click if this is selected and you can separate those dimensions so you never get confused on which one's which. And then you can put that back if you'd like. And then we have scale. You know, this messes with the size of what you're seeing on screen. And then we have rotation. The first parameter is revolutions. So once you make a keyframe, you can spin. And then the next is a nut, another range that goes into a circle that adds up to 360 degrees. And then opacity deals with the transparency of our text layer or our layer that's on screen. So what are these coordinates on position? So we talked about it's X and Y, but why is it these specific coordinates that they're dead center in the middle? If we go to our composition, and you see this little cross here at the very bottom. It says choose grid and guide options. Let's go ahead and click that. And we have a few options. What we're going to focus on is grid, guides, and rulers. Well, let's go to grid, go to guides, and let's do rulers. So now we have these trusty rulers on the side, and we have a grid displaying exactly the coordinates of what we're working with. So when we look at position, it's saying it's 540. If I look at this ruler, Okay, so 540 and 960. So on my Y axis, which is vertical, I'll go to kind of like a 960. And okay, that seems about right. And what, what did we say it was? 540? Hey, that's dead center. Okay. So if you move to the ruler, a little margin will pop up. It's this little two arrows pointing out. Click and drag and you'll expose the guide. So this is going to be our X axis. So we're going to right click. 540. There's one guide. Let's go to the top ruler, do the same thing, click and drag it down, right click, edit this position. This is going to be 960. And wouldn't you know, that is dead center in our grid. So you might see, let's go ahead and go to the whiteboard for this. So let's go ahead and talk about what we're seeing on screen first. So this is our plot point. It's right in the middle, 540 and 960. Okay, so there's no question about that. Now, these are our boundaries that the graph is actually showing us with our screen resolution. So right now, we're using 9 by 16. It is 1920 vertically, and then it's 1080 horizontally. But the 0, 0 is at this corner. It starts here on our graph. So if we go past 1920 vertically, our layer is going to be off screen. Same thing goes for X. So if I move past vertically for 
for the y like going up it's going to start going into the negatives because this is zero so here's 1080 as our x y is zero 1080 as our x and y is 1920 here's x at zero so like these are our boundaries and this is actually our canvas that we're working in in our project right now okay so traditionally I got a little confused of why this was happening because we're typically used to something like this. Our zero, zero point is at the center of any graph that you typically see. Here's our X, here's our Y, and then as you ascend up, you have the positive X and Y, positive X, negative Y, negative X, negative Y, and the negative X, positive Y. So having known this traditionally, this is actually what we're working with. So this is our grid. Let me know if a diagram like this helps you. Uh, it has helped me kind of figure out how I'm actually navigating within the software. And this plot point will change depending on the resolution. So keep in mind, we're doing 1080 by 1920. That's 9 by 16. Okay, that's what we're working with, that portrait. So I hope that gives you a better idea of what was happening. So if I were to make those plot points, let's go 0, 0. Where is that going to end up? That should end up at the top left. Precisely. It sure does. Let me go ahead and zoom out a little bit. There it is. So my anchor point is exactly at that point. Same thing goes if I were to go to 1080. We're going straight to the right. And so my boundary down here is 1920. So where is that going to put us? 1920. Just like how we had on our whiteboard. And then lastly, just to finish it out, go to zero. And now it's at the other corner. So the midpoint, if we hit our line, will bring us exactly to the center, 540, 960. That is what is happening when you use that tool. So now we understand this. I want to jump forward for a second to explain on a range selector where this, these parameters are going to come into play. So we understand what is happening with just the regular transform settings, right? We understand it from the grid. Now, when we start adding range selectors, I'm going to demonstrate with one property, and that is going to be the position. So where are the parameters starting? They're starting from 0, 0. Now, your text layer is where it is, because those are technically the transform settings. So when you move left, right, up, or down with the property that is in the range selector, they're starting from here in After Effects. I know it's a little bit confusing. So just keep in mind when you're dealing with those parameters and you see them as you add them, they're all going to start from zero, zero. They're starting here on the graph. They have their own graph. So if we move it to the left, you're now going to see those negative numbers because it's starting from here. Now, if you move it to the right, it's going to have positive numbers because you're getting closer to 1080, right? So if you go on the y-axis and you move it upward, it's going to have negative, going to have negative values. And then if you move it down, it's going to have positive values because you're getting closer to 1920. So keep in mind, these properties, when they start at 0, 0 inside of a range selector, they're starting from here. And the graph is exactly the same. So the reason why I'm bringing this up before we even get into the range selector is so you're not confused when you start seeing these parameters inside the range selector. But we're gonna discuss that as we get to it later on in this video. So next, I wanna talk about, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the grid that should give you an understanding of how you're working inside and what these numbers actually mean. And let's go ahead and do some animations. So I'm gonna turn off our grid and then I'll go ahead and turn off our guides too. I'm gonna to leave the rulers, they are helpful. So right now they are shown to me, but they might not be shown to you. Go ahead and hover by layer name or source name, whatever your layer says, and right click and make sure that you have these columns drop down and we're gonna make sure that switches is enabled. And you can also have modes enabled as well. We're gonna touch on that just very briefly in this tutorial, but make sure that both of those are good to go. And you should see them, here's mode, and then here's our switches. The one that we're gonna focus on uh, for right now is motion blur. It's these three little circles right here. Let's go ahead and turn that on. And that's going to add some shutter blur. But let's talk about anchor point real quickly before I go ahead and dive into the rest of these. Our anchor point, it can move around. So if I hit Y, 
This is my anchor point tool. It's also called the pan behind tool. And I can move the anchor point around. So I can move it. Now, if you have these lines come up, you can also hold control. So you can kind of freehand it. And let's say I put my anchor point around here. The anchor point is where the transformation is going to happen. So if I were to mess with the scale, instead of the animation happening from the center, what's it going to do? It's going to happen from that anchor point. Okay. Same thing. If I were to use rotation, say that I turned it, oh, it's going to turn where the anchor point is. It is the anchor. So again, I want us to get into the habit of when you make a text layer and type something out, no matter how big the range is, the anchor point kind of has its own parameters and its own grid to work with. So we want to make sure that is, it is centered because here's another detail. If I do horizontal, vertical, it didn't change. We know that it's at 540, 960, right? Well, our position isn't saying that. So this could be really problematic if you're doing really complex animations and you're like, where is my, where, why are these numbers off? It's not really centered. That's because the position is reading where the anchor point is. So if I were to open up our grid again, those are the plot points. 144, 1020. See how that works? Now I'm going to turn off the grid again and we're going to do that keystroke one more time because I want it to be a muscle memory thing for all of us as we type out text animations because this will take out a lot of guesswork as you get more complicated with your edits. So let's do control alt home or command option home and that will center our anchor point. And then the anchor point, it moves by pixels. So these coordinates are our X and Y. Same thing goes for position. These are our X and Y. This can move left and right. Let's go ahead and make a first animation. I'm going to just use the X value and I'm going to put it off screen. So I'm going to hit the keyframe in the way that you start one is hitting the stopwatch. That makes a keyframe. And then I'm going to go into one second. Now you can skip there with a page up and page down or holding shift. You can go 10 frames each, kind of skip around there. But we're going to go to the one second mark here. And then I'm going to stretch this out so I can see the whole thing. We have these two bars that can zoom in and out. But the second bar is your work area. So you can kind of scoot this in to have your animation repeat so you can see where your keyframes are lying. So here at the one second mark where our playhead is, this is our playhead, I'm going to do another keyframe. So for our second keyframe, we're just going to put it back to the middle. But our first keyframe, we're going to put it off screen. So I'm going to drag this out so it's off screen, something like that. Let's just do negative 460. All right, and let's watch the animation. Nice and linear, right? Nothing too special. All right, so let's go ahead and add some keyframes. We're going to do the same thing for the rest of these. Let's go ahead and add scale. Let's do zero for that first keyframe. Let's go to the one second mark, and it's going to end at 100%. See what that looks like. Now it's scaling in. Not too shabby. Let's start with rotation keyframe. Let's do one revolution. We're going to leave that at zero, and it's going to complete that revolution. So one. See what that does. Have it spinning in now. Awesome. And then we're going to add the opacity. Now, this might be a little bit tricky, so I'm going to delay the opacity till maybe it's like around here. Let's do zero. I'm just going to move it a few keyframes. On mine, timeline, it's at the 10 frame mark. Go ahead and get rid of that one. And then I'll have it end at 100. Okay. Gives us a different look. So it's spinning in, it's fading in. There we go. So nothing too crazy, but that's where usually people start to get a hang of like, oh, okay, this is how I can animate. And I'm also using the motion blur so it doesn't look so robotic. Now, if you wanted to animate this out, you could click and drag your mouse over so you select all of your keyframes. Let's move our playhead maybe a little bit forward in time and stretch out our work area as well. And then just do control C, control V. So control C to copy those, control V to paste. And now we have the same animation happening. But that's not exactly what we wanted. We wanted it to kind of go out. So how do we do that? So all these keyframes, we just select them, the new ones that we did. We're going to right click keyframe assistant, time reverse keyframes. So now we had an animation coming in. 
Here's it coming in, and now we have it going out. All right. So those are kind of the basics of what you're going to do with keyframes. There is a little bit of math involved, but you can do it visually by just moving your parameters around now that you know that there's we're working within a grid. So let's go ahead and take these off. And I'm going to show you the speed graph. Now I'm just going to use the position points. So I'm going to go into disable the scale, the rotation, and the opacity. And we're just going to leave it with position. I'm just going to go ahead and hit reset. And then I'm going to do the same thing to negative 460. All right. So with these keyframes, I'm going to select them. And we're going to look at our graph editor. So with these selected, right now my anchor point is selected. I can select all of them by clicking and holding shift. And that will show me all of my different parameters within the graph. But we only want to see what position is up to. So I'm going to, I'm going to hold control and deselect these. So we're just seeing the position. So on our speed graph, I can kind of move the margins. We can see our Y is green and it is completely constant, right? It's completely constant. It's a straight line. But if we look at our X, which is this red line, this is a linear line. So at, so at the bottom, we're starting at what? 460. And then we're ending at 540. All right, so that tracks. Now let's go to the speed graph. And the way to know which one you're in, you can right click and then you'll, you'll see this. Or you can also go down to this little box where it looks like a checklist. And you can also get to it from there. Let's go to the speed graph. And you'll see that the speed is at a thousand pixels per second. And it's a flat line right now. So the speed is constant the entire time. All right, I'm going to go back to our value graph. And let's talk about and how you navigate the value graph uh, when you're working with keyframes. So these have to be selected. You can either click on one of them, hold shift and click on the other, or you can click and drag them over. But make sure when you do that, that they're actually selected. So this top one is selected, but this bottom one isn't because it looks like it's transparent. Make sure it's selected. So I'm going to hold shift, shift and click on it. So both of these are selected. So now I have these options over here. I can make another keyframe or I can edit where it is. And then we have a select hold. So the keyframe will not move at all. So that's just going to be a constant kind of like what we see on our Y. It's not moving. And then we're going to keep coming back to linear because this is what our line is. It's, a, it's not a straight line, but it's one that isn't being messed with. It is linear. And then we have auto bezier. Now this adds influence points. I won't be using it in this tutorial, but I'll show you what it does. So if I go ahead and add it, zoom in a bit, it's going to add influence points. So if I right click and go to our speed graph, we can now see these influence points. So now you might be familiar with this. If you've seen it inside Premiere, you can now mess with the velocity and speed. But I don't want to do that right now because what a lot of animators do, which I have now come accustomed to why, oh, this is why they do it, is because it's so much easier. It is a keystroke called F9 on your keyboard, and that is going to enable this little tool right here, Easy Ease. So Easy Ease has this nice little S curve, right? Now our motion is kind of coming in. It's coming in fast, and it's also ending fast. So it's coming in fast and ending fast. So it's kind of this balanced motion on both sides. If I go ahead and select both of them again and I go to our speed graph, you'll see that it's a balanced ratio that it's adding to this. So we have it coming in fast, it's hanging up there and it's coming down fast. So it's nice and balanced. What a lot of people do is, and for this example, I'll go ahead and drag over our influence point to 100%. You'll see that influence change. And you'll have a different speed, a little bit faster. So now it's really, really fast, and then it's ending slower. That's what we did with that influence point. But I'll go ahead, and with these are selected, I'm going to do the linear tool to bring it back to a constant, go back to our value graph. So that is the first one. That's probably the one that you're going to use because I think that's most flexible because you're getting a balanced speed and now you can just adjust it where you want it. But let's go ahead and see easy ease in. So this is gonna be applied to the second keyframe. And what it's doing is it is a slow start and a fast finish. Whereas easy ease out is a fast start and a slow finish. So that is kind of how you determine how to identify both of them. So the motion is changing, 
So for ease in, it's a slow start, fast end. And for ease out, it's a fast start and a slow end. Okay, so we have that established. What are you likely going to do? You're likely going to go ahead and select both of your keyframes. Let's go ahead and make it linear again and do F9. And that's going to automatically give us easy ease. And you'll also see this if we go back. Let's say let's control Z that to where they're linear. You'll also see it on your keyframe. So if you hit F9, oh, that is the indication for easy ease. So now we have that. We know how to use it. So if we go back to our graph editor, so right now we're in our value. We need to go and mess with that speed. Let's go to our speed editor, select our keyframes, and we can move around how we want the speed to be influenced. So I can do, let's go ahead and show just different ways to do it because what you're doing and why you're messing with these influence points is that the distance and the path that it has traveled hasn't changed. It's one second, but you're changing the speed on how it's getting there. So let's go ahead and do two examples. Let's do control D, control D, and then I'll do two more examples. All right, so I have them all in different positions but we're gonna change the speed to all of them to kind of show you the difference that it's still happening at one second, but they're all coming in at different speeds. So if I select this one, my first position, this is balanced. We'll go ahead and keep that balanced. Let's go to the second one. We're scooting this one in at the end. So let's go ahead and make sure I have the influence at 100 on this one. Okay, that looks good there. Let's go to the next one, go to position, and I'm gonna modify this one. So this one's gonna go back. I can hit linear and then do easy ease again to make my life so much easier. And we'll go to 100% on that. So here are three different styles. If I select all these, you'll see them on the graph. Let's go ahead and pull this up, position, position. So now we see all three different speeds. Here we go. Different looks, different things that you can do. And it's all happening still between one second. So I hope that makes sense. That is the speed and value graph. It's telling you how fast it is going and it is traveling through time with these two keyframes. You can add more keyframes and modify those as well. And this isn't just on position. You can adjust the speed on any of these parameters in the transform window. So let's go ahead and move to the next options before we take a dip into the animate settings. One thing I do want to talk about is the source text. So what's really cool about the source text is that you can change the text to so many different things inside one text layer. It's pretty cool. So if I go over a few frames, this is going to be what is on screen. I'll go over 10 frames and then let's go ahead and just type in something else. We are doing great. We're doing great work. And then I can go further and let's just do something else. Let's do uh, yes, indeed. All right, so now if you play it back, go ahead and do that. It's changing all inside one text layer. So that is really useful if you're doing something complex and you want something else to come up within the animator or the same text layer. All right, let's go ahead and move. I'm gonna go ahead and delete those and move to path options. This allows you to attach a mask to the text layer. So make sure that the text layer is selected and we're going to go up and you can hit Q on your keyboard, but I'm going to change it from the rectangle tool to the ellipse tool. And the way you do that is you hold down alt and you can cycle through by clicking. So I'm going to go ahead and find the ellipse tool. There it is. And go ahead and hold shift. So you make a perfect circle when you click and drag. If you don't hold shift, you're going to get something like this, but we're going to hold shift, click that. And there it is. So our mask should appear inside of our text layer. Now from path, we can now get the drop down to mask one. And now we have these options for the first margin, second, second margin. We can reverse the path. There's all kinds of different stuff that you can do there. So that is what path options can do. So if we go ahead and delete this mask, I've also seen people make a custom path for the text to go down. And what they'll do is they'll take the pin tool, which is G on your keyboard, and let's just start making a path. So I can click and drag so these vertices come out. Let's do something like that, kind of bend it. Okay, something like that, something like that. All right, so we're already off screen. So with this mask, I can open it up and there's a mask path. 
So it's already selected. Let's go ahead and hit Control C, right? Control C. And we're going to go to Transform and go to our position. And go ahead and move your playhead over because what we just created was keyframes. We just created coordinates. Remember that graph that we talked about? We just put our plotted points. So it's going to make, looks like one, two, three, four, five keyframes. And we have position selected, control V. So that's what it did. One, two, three, four, five with those plotted lines that we made with our pen tool. So if we play it, now we have it flying down this path. So that's another way and something that I've seen a few people do when they want to make some wacky animation is that you can just make the path yourself. So that is available. And just again, like we made the mask from the pen tool and just plotted points by clicking and dragging to make these different vertices. So we copied that path and then we put it on position. All right. So there is that. I'm going to go ahead and delete these keyframes. Next is more options. More options is interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and center this, my, my line tool again, and the anchor grouping. So if you click on it, you'll see what's actually happening. We have these little red X's, right? So if I zoom in, it actually doesn't change like the size of them. They actually get smaller as I keep zooming in. So I'll go ahead and blow it up on Premiere Pro. But this are the anchor points. So the drop down correlates to, oh, this is character by character. So there's going to be an anchor on each character, even the space that is in between the words. So here is kind of a clue when you get started with text animators is they have word. So there's a anchor point on each word. Very nice. And then if we go to line for every line, there's technically a line right here, but you can see the anchor point. And I'll go ahead and make another line so we can see it, that it is indeed counting all the lines. So here is another line, another line. Okay. If I click off of it, go ahead and click the anchor point again, I can see, oh, line one, line two, line three. Like it is getting the center, that anchor point for each line. Now, let me go ahead and delete these. So now if we go to all, it's actually dead center, dead center of our range. I'll go ahead and move the cursor tool so you can actually see it. But there it is. All right. So that is what all these drop downs do. And as you change that, we have X and Y coordinates by percentages. And you'll see, okay, so here's the X. We could shift them over or we can also shift them up or down. Now, per character palette, we have fill stroke per character palette. This is one that I like that it's already the default because I think it looks the best. And I'll show you what I mean in a second, but fill and stroke. So this implies that we need a stroke on our text. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Over here on my properties under text, we have our stroke. Let's enable that. And I'm just going to roll with, I think my default was already at 10 or 13. But there it is. So with character palette, you're like, okay, it seems normal. Uh, what the difference is, is if I mess with the tracking, you'll see that they overlap one another. You see that? The stroke is overlapping the next character per character palette. Does that make sense? So if I go over to all fills over strokes, it kind of just blends together with that tracking. Let me put it back to zero. But what is happening? exactly what the description is. All fills are more prominent over the strokes. And then all strokes over fills is the exact opposite. The stroke is more prominent over the fill. So that is what's happening there. I'm going to go back to the default per character palette. I think it looks the best. And then enter character blending. So these are a lot of the exact same blending modes that you'll see with your regular blending modes. So like you can see these and then you can also see these as well. There's a little bit more. I don't know when I would use these. Like uh, I'll go ahead and pull in an image of myself. So I'm, so I'm behind the text layer and with the, let's just pick one. Let's do like difference. Like you'll see there's a slight change on each of the strokes, right? So it's very minute details like that. So if I do like a stencil Luma, you know, you can see more of the differences that this inter-character blending is doing for the stroke specifically. Like this is specifically on the stroke as you kind of change around with these settings. So that is what that is doing. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that image. Go ahead and put this thing back to normal. Let's go and dive into the animate tool. Hit that little play button and we're going to go through every single one of these. The ones that I will not go into too much detail because they're a rabbit hole within themselves. 
is the enable per character 3D, but I'm gonna show you the basics of like what is happening. So let's go ahead and start with that. All right, so if we open it up, what just happened? We were so accustomed to transform and with the X and Y, we were working within two dimensional shapes, but now we are in 3D mode. So we added another axis and that is the Z axis. So we had X, which was left and right. We had Y, which is up and down. And now we have Z, which is forward and backward. Okay, so that is what is happening here. We have scale with that dimension. We have position that has the Z and the rotation as well as the orientation. So before I go any further, I already changed my renderer. And what will happen is this will be grayed out and it will give you an option to change the renderer. And what I'm talking about is if I go to composition, composition settings, 3D renderer, I can go to classic 3D is what is going to be the default. And that is probably what you will see. It will, you'll see change renderer. We want to go to the geometry settings, but I'll quickly explain what is happening here once you get into uh, just classic 3D. So we have this space and now we're introduced to cameras. So to navigate your camera, you can also hit this orbit around cursor tool or hit one or shift one. And now you can click and drag around the layer, right? Pretty cool. Now this isn't changing. You see, none of the parameters are changing. I'm just simply moving my imaginary camera right now. Now, if I want to get things back to where they are, you can see at the very bottom here on our uh, composition panel, let me go ahead and move these margins over. You can see it says active camera. Go ahead and hit that. And we can do reset default camera and that'll put you right back where we started. And you can also get there from view, reset default camera, okay? Now from here, we can do different views, which is two views. Okay, we can see it from the side at this kind of angle. And now you have more of a representation of what is Y, X, and Z. Z is the blue, Y is the green, X is the red. All right, and you can also do four views. So you have more views to work with when you're animating. All right, but to make this less complicated, I'm gonna go back to the first view. So that is kind of what is happening there. Let's talk about the new parameters. So we have orientation. The way that I would animate orientation is, you know, we're, we're having this nice little tilt. We're having this nice little pan. We're having this kind of rotate. We are accentuating on this gray ball here, the X, Y, and Z. So that's what's happening with orientation. I kind of view orientation as maybe the blueprint of what you're animating and then the rotation could also serve as that as well. So these can work in conjunction. That's why both of them are there. And then, you know, we're left with opacity, which is the same thing like the others. But the last thing I'll mention is position. We have that Z to where you can bring it forward and backward. So I'm going to go ahead and hit reset and that will bring everything back to zero. Now, before we get into material options, I actually want to show you with the geometry options. So we can't open this up. We actually have to change the renderer. Can't really say that word. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Let's do Cinema 4D. Now, when this comes up, it might take your computer a little bit of time to pull this up, but we're going to see what is enabled, the new stuff that we can do with Cinema 4D. And then it's also going to disable some things. So we're going to lose stuff like motion blur, light transmission, track mats. I know that's a big deal breaker for some people. There's different methods out there, but this is what you're getting. This is what you're not getting. And we're gonna go ahead and click OK. So if you haven't noticed by now, over in our switches, you can see this little box. This is our 3D layer dimensions. So if we ever wanted to get out of here, we could just click that. But I'm gonna go ahead and enable it again. Now we have our geometry options. I'm going to go ahead and bump up the bevel depth. We're gonna do, I don't know, something like eight. So it's really prominent. And we're going to do the extrusion. So this is going to push the text back and make it into like a thick block. This is probably what you think when you think of 3D. So let's do something like 50. All right, we got a little bit of 3D going on. So to really make sure like we're really seeing this, I've seen this on a few tutorials, we're going to right click, go to new, and we're going to add a physical light to what we're seeing on screen. So we're going to add light. It's going to be a spotlight and we can change those settings. But now we have a light to kind of show us what's happening. I'm going to modify it. I'm going to go to transform. We're going to do light options. And instead of 
spot. I think I want to do point. Yeah, point is going to be good. So I can kind of see what's happening. And then I can go to orbit and kind of just move it around and see what's going on. So we have this nice shape from our extrusion, right? Pretty cool. So the bevel styles, we'll go ahead and walk through those. First one is angular. What you'll see is that it has this nice little beveled edge, like it's getting carved. And uh, things like it's angular, it's kind of flat, flat facing. Now the next one is concave. So with a lens, light comes in and it's more of like a uh, slim shape, kind of like an hourglass. So how it looks here is that it's really shaping up and it's thinning what you're seeing. So that's why it kind of looks like it's really cut out. And then convex is the exact opposite. So when, it's when the light is coming in, it's getting bigger. So we go to con convex, it's getting bigger. So it's, not it's that nice bubbly look. So there you go. So whole bevel depth, this actually controls the holes that are in the letters. So like the B's in this situation and the O, the A, the R. So if I crank this down to zero, you'll see the holes get a little bit bigger. That's what that is doing there. And the extrusion, we already talked about, it's like it's making this thicker by pushing it out. So I'll go ahead and kind of move the light over. You know, you can move it with your transform settings, kind of shine it. See how big this thing is. Let's go to material options. So this gets really, really fun, really, really fast and a little bit daunting. <laughs> so I'm going to add a like my image like we did in our last one. And I'm going to make this 3D by hitting that switch. And so this is kind of where this comes into play. Like we can add shadows. So we can tell the text to cast shadows. So if I bring this forward, I actually need to bring our text forward in this example. Let me bring it forward. Okay, so it's casting this big shadow on my image. And then you can have it accept shadows, accept lights, which is what it's doing right now with our light. But uh, there's a lot of different settings here to mess with uh, once you're in the world of 3D. And this deserves its own video as is. But I just wanted to kind of show you uh, what you could play around with now that you kind of know what all this means. All right, let's go ahead and move to the animations that you see all the time. And then I'm going to turn off our switch and that will bring us back to our text layer. I'm going to turn off our spotlight because we don't need it. All right, so 3D is kind of the exception. Now we're getting into anchor point position, scale, skew, rotation, opacity, all transform properties, fill color. These have their own subsections with RGB, hue, saturation, brightness, opacity. That's also with stroke color as well. We have stroke width. Tracking, line anchor, line spacing, character offset, character value, and blur. Let's go ahead and talk through all of those. So what's nice about this first section, you see how they're kind of like bordered. This first section, you can add all of them right off the bat. So let's add all of them and kind of show you how you can navigate with the range selector. So we have an animator and a range selector. The range selector is what is happening on screen. So let's go ahead and open it up. We have start end and offset so anything that you type in is now considered a range and the range is identified with start and end so these two points start are here if you hover over your cursor on your range you'll see the margins kind of come together for that selection that is that is your range selector tool so with our start it's at the start. So I can drag this over and now you see the start moving in percentages. And I can do the same at end. Now the percentages will move for end. So we're selecting what is in our range. That's what's happening. And then the offset. The offset is almost like the vehicle to animate your text. So Start and end is selecting your range, exactly what you want to animate. It's like, oh, I only want to animate this amount of letters. Okay. The offset is going to say, great, let's go ahead and do that. And it's going to run the animation. Now you can do animations with start and end, but it gets a little bit more complicated as you start using different range selectors, but we'll talk about that later. But for offset, let's go ahead and start with zero. And what's interesting about offset is that it goes to negative 100 and 100. Zero to 100, you're going to use at specific times. And I'm going to go through that as well. But let's start out with zero. 
and we're just going to make a keyframe to one second. Okay. And we're going to go to 100. So let's watch what offset is doing. As we scroll through, we see the range selector moving. So, so our animation is working. But how is it moving? It's moving character by character, and it's even passing through the spaces that don't have any characters in them, right? Okay, so keep that in mind. Let's go ahead and open up Advanced. And now we have Units. Units is what is being showed for the range selector. Now, I have a preference when I'm dealing with complex animations to use Index, and here's why. So if I hit this drop down, here's Index you'll see that our range selector now changed to numbers. So here, if we move it around, let's do, let's do N, let's move this to U. Now we're counting the characters. So there's three characters, one, two, three. That's why it's showing me that number. But if we go back, well, if I go to the end, why is it showing me 26? Because it's also counting those spaces. There's only 21 letters here, but there's in fact, five spaces, five characters in your range. So your total range is 26. That is what it is saying. All right, but for this remainder of the tutorial, I'll keep it with percentage. All right, based on, now this is crucial because this is kind of where the magic starts. And so when we watch this animation go through our range, right, from our offset, we can also change it to characters excluding spaces. So as we start to drag this through, now it's totally skipping over those spaces. Okay, those are options. We can also do words. All right, so now we're going to go word by word. See how it's skipping around to each word? Boom, boom, boom. And then we also have lines. So we only have two lines, so it's just going to pop once. So there's one line, two lines. There it goes. One line, two lines. Next is mode. So I have a bonus video talking about me trying to deconstruct this because I've only gotten so far and we're just going to use add for this tutorial. But uh, I do want people to go to that video. Please leave comments because I want to have the most accurate video out there because there's no one that has been able to crack this code of what's happening with this mode. So we're going to keep it with add today. But uh, the next is amount, and this affects the effectiveness of the mode. So if you go to zero, it's not going to do anything. So we're going to keep that at 100. Next is shape. All right. So I'm going to turn on the whiteboard again. Thank you to my wife for uh, doing these beautiful illustrations. But this is what is happening with these. We have square, ramp up, ramp down, triangle, round, and smooth. So. Before I go any further, we talked about offset and how it can go to negative 100. Start and end cannot go that far. They can only go through 0 and 100. That is the range. But the offset can go to negative 100. Now at 0, for most animations, you're going to keep this shape at square. Square does just fine with an offset 0 to 100. Now, these other ones, ramp up, ramp down, triangle, round, and smooth, these all need to start at negative 100 for them to work properly. But I'm going to keep that at zero and show you what is happening with these shapes. So I'm going to change my text, my range, to a bunch of periods and show you what the program is doing. I wanted to thank Motion by Nick. Uh, for this example, because for me, I needed a more exaggerated explanation, and that is what I'm trying to provide for you in this video. So I'll go ahead and move our position. I'll move it up a bunch. And then now you'll see what's happening. So with square, imagine there's a huge square that's moving left to right. That's all that's happening. It's a big square moving left from right. So now this square is just passing through. Right? It's that big square. It's just moving through and letting all of these fall. I'm going to go to the beginning and I'm going to show you each of these shapes and then I'll go ahead and play through them as well. So we have ramp up. Oh, we have this graph now. I'm going to go ahead and turn off motion blur real, real fast. To keep in mind, all of these shapes are just moving left to right. So if I play it, okay, 
Next one, ramp down. Okay, it's added here. You might think it's going this way. No, no, no. All these shapes are going left to right. So what are these going to do? They're going to be pushed up because it's moving left to right. Next one, we have triangle, and it's a literal triangle being placed. So left to right. Next one is round, big oval shape moving through. Going to the next one is smooth. We have kind of a more bell-shaped, like a more defined oval going through. But that is what is happening. So you'll see, as I said before, on square, this does just fine because the square is just it's going out. It's just moving out of the way and the animation can go through. So for 0 to 100 as your offset, that's going to work just fine if you're just using square as your shape. And so for the others, ramp up, ramp down, triangle, round, and smooth, you're going to have to put the offset to negative 100 because this isn't a complete animation. I'll show you. So with ramp up, let's go to our example again. So this animation isn't doing anything for us right now. Like it's incomplete. So we have to go past that threshold with offset because we want it to start there. So now we have that animation. It's not a great animation, but it, Serves a purpose for this illustration. Same with ramp down. Like now we have that animation going up. So all of these. So just keep in mind, like the only time you want to use offset from zero to 100 is with square. And then for all the other uh, shapes, you want to use offset at negative 100 to 100. All right. Next, we have ease high and ease low. I'm going to go back to our nice little demonstration and I'm going to show you. What is happening here? So I'll go to ramp up, ease high, think of ease in. So if I bend this, oh, what does that look like? That looks like our graph editor, does it not? And then if I bend this, ease low, oh, so we have that S shape again. That is what is happening. So we have ease high and ease low. I usually, with ramp up and ramp down, is uh, a lot of the animations that I use and that you'll see, is uh, they'll probably put it at 50, and that gives us that nice little S curve that we all love, which is kind of equivalent to what? Easy ease. Okay. All right. So, if, you know, if I have something like mid 100, it's going to have that beautiful cascading. Right? Looking good. Okay. Next is randomize order. Pretty self explanatory. All of those are going to now animate in a random order. And then you can also replicate these. So if you ever want to replicate one of your moves, make sure that you actually put in a coordinate for random seed. Because apparently random seed at zero is truly random. I know that's a little confusing. But if you give this any point at all, you'll be able to create the same randomization because it's based on math. The only true random values that you will have is at zero. So it's a random number generator, but that is how you use that. And just a quick note, if you saw this, square has its own smoothness. And all that's doing is at 100%, you have the motion happening. But at zero, it's basically going to teleport. Yeah. Different look, right? Okay. Let me go back to ramp up. All right, so that is the range selector explained as far as what we're going to do. Next, we're going to talk through these parameters first. We have anchor point, position, scale, skew, axis, rotation, and opacity. Since we already talked about transform, these basically all do the same things, but the new ones that we have is skew and skew axis. So these are fun because these can be kind of crazy when you put them on a text layer. I kind of equate it to something I would see off of Scooby-Doo. But I'm going to go ahead and type in our example again. But I'm making sure that my anchor point is centered always. And we're moving that layer down. Okay. All right. So I have everything centered. Let's kind of talk through what's happening. So the anchor point, of course, X and Y, you can move these over. I usually don't use the anchor point when I'm dealing with animators. I just haven't had the need to use them, but maybe they will. But they demonstrate and function as a, a X and Y parameter. Same with position, same stuff. You can move stuff around. Then we have scale. This is going to scale things up and down. So if I go to zero, let's watch that happen. Awesome. Oh, we have randomize selected. Let's turn that off. All right. So they all come up. All right. And everything is coming up character by character. So if we want to cycle through those, 
characters excluding spaces. Awesome. We want to do words. Going to do all the words. This might look familiar to you. Okay. And then last one, we have lines. There you go. So that's how you can use those in conjunction with scale. Go ahead and put that back to 100. So with position, same thing. If you wanted to move things around, these are all going to move by pixels. So we have our animation created with our offset, right? We've already chosen ramp up. We got the ease high and ease low. And we can choose how we want them to animate in. So let's say that I want this to move from up to down. So I'm going to have my starting position to be higher. And the destination is already set. It's already centered to where we started. So it's going to move down, right? So you can also think as when you take your text from Premiere Pro, or if you're just making a, a text, you're putting it to where the destination is. The animator is going to start wherever you want it to start, and then it's going to end wherever you put the destination. Just a quick note, as I'm talking about that, in these examples, I'm talking through 0% to 100% or negative 100 to 100. You can also flip that when I'm talking about destinations. So in this example, I'm using position. My starting point is just where I have it. It's dead center in the middle. So I can start with 100% and then I can run the animation to go one second and do something else at 0%. So my first keyframe's at 100, my second is at zero. So it doesn't just have to be zero to 100, you, you can flip that because as I changed the destination as I dubbed it in the video, this can also happen. And I also do this in a later example. I just wanted to reiterate that and make it very clear that you can go both ways. So next is skew. We can just skew this a little bit and watch the animation go through. Nothing too special. Now what's cool about skew axis is that it actually takes, it actually takes the axis of our skew. So these work in conjunction and almost serve as a rotation as well. So as I said, Scooby-Doo, like this is something that I would see in Scooby-Doo. It's almost like a shiver. And these are revolutions that are happening on the axis itself. So that's why it looks like they are shaking really, really fast. And then you can do more, more subtle effects as well. You can do, uh, this is going to go through 360 because they're, they're going around an axis, right? So some cool stuff that you could do with that one. So same with rotation, this goes to 360 degrees. We can have these rotate in through our animation. I'm gonna go ahead and reset that as well. And we'll go to opacity, do that at zero. And guess what? All we're gonna fade in. And you can get different options with the based on, do words, come in word by word, right? So I'll give you a sneak peek of uh, what this could be, right? So we're going to go back to square. Let's go back to 0% for that first keyframe. And let's move the opacity to 50, which it is. And let's do word by word. So who does that look like? Does that ring any bells? So a lot of options that you could do in here. Let's go ahead and move to the next parameters. So you can add to a range selector one at a time. You can do the property and just add one. And you can also take some away if... You decide to do what I did, which is just, oh, we're going to add all of these first parameters. All of them can come in. You're like, okay, I don't want this one. I can get rid of this. You just select them and press backspace. All right, let's go ahead and get rid of these last parameters. I'm just going to keep position there for now. And let's go ahead and add a, another property. We're going to do fill color. And we're just going to mess with RGB. And this is just taking whatever the starting point is. So if I wanted this to be a different color, I can move it around, make it a different color and then play the animation. There it is. Simple as that. You could have it fade if you want, something with like ramp up. Only problem is, is that uh, you probably want to do negative 100 when you're changing those shapes. Just reminders all around of what you could do. Okay, so that's fill color. Next one is pretty simple. We have property stroke color. So if we have a stroke, which we're going to have to enable, we can make the stroke color different. So if you have kind of a dynamic animation going on and it comes back to normal, there you go. Just keep in mind, our destination is a different color, right? So I can also toggle this off so it just doesn't have a stroke all, all together. 
But when you do that, you're not going to have the same color. So when I add the stroke, now it's changing, right? Some different options there. And then we can also control the width. So the width can change. So right now it's sitting at 10, right? So if I go and add property stroke width, I can now make the width bigger to start out with. And then eventually it will shrink because we're animating through. So there it is. Now all of these can change with, do we remember the more options? That's right. We can do fills over strokes and that will have a slight change to what we see on screen. We can also do all strokes over fills. Looks a little crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> but those are all options and that, that's how they can speak to each other uh, when you're going through this. So I'll go ahead and put that back to per character palette. Go ahead and get rid of these. I'll just keep position for now. Go ahead and close up more options. Let's go back to properties. Let's go to tracking. So this is part of one of the things that I don't know what it does. The before, after, and before and after. Uh, we're going to leave with before and after. Uh, it's relatively easy to do what, or like what's going on here. So if I go ahead and just do the keyframes without the offset, I'll go ahead and go to square and then make that keyframe zero. So let's go ahead and change the tracking amount. I'm going to turn off the stroke. Tracking amount is going to be 10. All right, so we're starting from 10 and then we're going to go back. All right. So what's interesting about the tracking type is that most people will use it as its own keyframe. So what I think is, is that this is the only way within After Effects that we're able to animate the tracking amount because it's sitting right here, right? Here's the tracking. But we don't have a way to animate it without being inside of a range selector. And I'm pretty sure that's by design, but that's just an observation that I made. So I'm going to go ahead and delete these keyframes because uh, what a lot of people want to do is they just want the look. So, for example, if I wanted, you know, something drastic like uh, 25, I'll go one second in time. And then I'll do something like I'll just go back to zero. Make sure that offset is good there. All right. And then all these are going to be brought together. Now, if you're not getting this look right now, just make sure that everything is kind of at its default. So we have start in offset. And then in your properties, the paragraph has to be centered for this specific animation to happen. All right. So that is the tracking amount. That is the space between the characters. Next, we have, we go ahead and hit add. We'll do line anchor. Line anchor is interesting. It kind of works similarly to the range selector, except that it's choosing the midpoint and it's an imaginary line. You can't see it like the range selector. And here's what I mean. I'll go ahead and make this a one line so I can better illustrate what's happening. So we have you are the, and then the animation as of right now is that they're just all pulling together. But let's pay attention to what's happening. All of the letters are moving except R, right? So our current line anchor position is at 50%. The imaginary line right now is on R because that is exactly in the middle of our range. If I go to zero, it's going to be the Y because that is where the imaginary line is for these tracking to follow. And then if you already guessed for 100%, it's going to be that E. So that is your line anchor. Go put it back to 50. All right, next one, add property, line spacing. So with our, you know, our other line that we deleted, so you are the best in the biz, we're controlling the size of that. So again, a lot of people will just use the keyframes here. So if I wanted this to kind of come up, so the starting point, so this is going to be my end point. I want it to end there. Okay, but I'm going to move this down with uh, the Y parameter because these are pixels as well, X and Y. I'm just going to move this down. So the animation is like that. Not too shabby, right? So those are that section. I think we got all those. I was tracking line anchor and line spacing. Next is character offset. Okay, these are interesting. <laughs> so let's go ahead and dive into these. All right, for this next example, I'm going to type in Saturn. And then we're going to add to our animator property character offset. 
All right, so when we add this, we have three things come in. We have character alignment, character range, and character offset. So character alignment, uh, imagine each of these characters have their own grid. And as they animate, we're telling them, hey, you should animate from the left or top. And hey, you should animate from the center. You should animate from the right or bottom. Or hey, you should adjust the kerning. Now, adjust kerning is the adding and subtracting the characters are going to do as they cycle through this animation. And I'll demonstrate that here in a second. Let's go back to the left or top. Character range. So we can preserve case and digits, or we can have the full Unicode. And the full Unicode is indeed the full Unicode, which I think is 149,000 characters. So you can apply all those. So what are we talking about here? Well, with character offset, we can offset what is being displayed on screen. So, we're, so we have the letter S, A, T, U, R, N. If we were to offset all of those by one, we're going forward in time, right? If we were to offset by, by one though, by one offset. So let's do like three. So we started from S, T, U, V. Okay, there's V. We started from A, A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. So that is what the character offset is doing. So the, you know, the further you get, and you're going to wrap back around at the 26 mark because that's what the letters are. So as you in increase your offset, just keep in mind, like once you get to the 26 mark, you're probably going to loop back around because you're messing with the alphabet. All right. So let's go ahead and do a keyframe. So we're going to start at 23 and we're going to end at zero. So there it is. The animations. We talked about character alignment. So these, some of these characters are overlapping, right? That's because they're anchored at that top or left portion of their own grid. Now, if we do center, it's a little bit different because now they're animating from the center, right? And then as we said, right or bottom. Now they're animated from the bottom, still a lot of overlap. So a lot of people will default to adjust kerning. So nothing is overlapping at all when this animation is happening, right? They're all adjusting as they go. So I just reset my offset, nothing's happening. Let's bring in our next parameter, that is character value. This is also interesting. So character value stems from the ASCII. And what that stands for is I'm going to put it on screen now is the American Standard Code for Information Exchange. The ASCII is a standard that assigns letters, numbers, and other characters in the 256 slots available in the 8-bit code. So this number is created from binary, which is a language of all computers. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate uh, from this list. And of course, you can access this list and see what is on there. But if I wanted a specific character value, let's say I wanted the at symbol. So the value of that is 64. So if I just type in 64, there it is. There it is. Now, there's a great tutorial online. This is by Mobox Graphics, where he animated something to look like a computer screen. And he used the value 45, which I believe is a hyphen. Pretty cool, right? So if we go ahead and run an animation, what you would do here is you can go to offset. And we're on square, so it's a nice linear shape. And then we're going to go to one second mark and hit... Go to 100% and we will watch these change. There it is. So some different looks, some different things that you could do. And then you can also add on to this with the character offset. So if you wanted to add 45, it's like, oh, well, you can offset that to the next characters, right? Gives you some different options. You can stack them on top of each other, but that is what they do. Last thing that I didn't talk about was the character range. So Preserve case and digits is simply if I change this to a capital S and then we'll do a lowercase Saturn. If I actually turn off these character values, so S is capitalized, it's going to stay capitalized. That's what is, that is what is being preserved. As far as full Unicode, we're going to get all kinds of random stuff in here. It's going to pull from the entirety of the Unicode. So as you have more offsets, the crazier this can get as you animate through. But that should give you a lot of ideas. You can stack them on top of each other, try different things. Let me know what works for you as we finish up with Blur. So Blur is a simple one. 
It's exactly what you think it would do. Uh, I usually go ahead and pair it with a high value, like 350 pixels, where it's really blown out. And then I can have it animate in. Right now it's on words. You can switch that up, of course, with characters. One at a time. Get all kinds of different looks. Or you could change the shape. Make sure that you're changing those offsets and you can do it from there. Now to wrap up this section of the video, we are going to add position and we're going to add a selector and we're going to start off with wiggly selector. So the way that I had this video kind of match up, if you haven't already noticed, is that I wanted to go through each thing before we just start making animations. Like we need to know what each of these things do. That being said, we add a position. We're going to do add. So now we have our animator. We're going to go to selector and select wiggly. Now, Wiggly Selected, let's go ahead and hit that drop down. This looks cool because right out the gate, you don't even have to animate anything. You can just move the position. So I'll move it four pixels to the left, and then I'll move it for five pixels up and down. Let's see what that does. Gives us a nice, subtle wiggle. So what's in here? Another thing that I am trying to get answers to is the mode is intersect. We also have all of these coming back to us, all the modes, add, subtract, intersect, min, max, and difference. And then we have the max amount, the min amount. We're just going to leave those alone. Now we can change the based on as well. So if we do something like words, you'll see that the words are just wiggling independently. Same with lines. Each line is kind of doing their own thing. Now I do like characters because that kind of have more like independence and a little bit of flair to it. Now you can make this more drastic as you move the position around. You can make this look real crazy, real fast. I do like the subtle look of it, but next you can change the intensity. So if you want it to be really, really wiggly, you can change the intensity. So how I visualize correlation is think of like you're herding cattle or a flock of birds. So at 50%, everyone's like, kind of like together and doing their thing. Let me go back to like something like two. So they're moving independently, but they're still kind of together. At zero, you know, everyone is doing their own thing, right? But at 100%, they're all kind of moving as one, as a unit. So you have that more subtle shake, okay? So 50 is still a good place to start. Next, we have temporal phase and spatial phase. So I linked an article by an Adobe expert, Andrew Yule. Someone had a question about these two, as I didn't know what they were. But uh, the gist of it is that temporal is your x-axis and spatial is a y-axis. So what's interesting about this is that how Andrew sums it up is that it, they really don't do that much. And they do have revolutions and they do go to 360 degrees, but in a random generated property like the wiggly selector, it's not going to do that much. So I wouldn't really mess with these, but that's the explanation that an expert said. So something there. Now, lock dimensions. This is interesting because I think it's locking the based on. So for this, like we have characters, like it's locking the characters in a certain grid that is around them. So if I move it to like words, you can see it now it's kind of locked with the words. They only have enough space to move within the range. So if I take it off, you'll see that they're a little bit more independent. Okay, so random seed. The only thing that we talked about that is truly random about this property, if it sits at zero. If you wanted to replicate an animation, go ahead and make sure that you note down whatever the parameter is, because that is mathematical and that is something that you can actually replicate. Something there as well. So that wraps it up with most of what you need to know to get started with the range selector. I hope you get a little bit of confidence from this. Next, we are going to do an example from our Ali Abdal video, and that was from Mr. Horse. So let's go ahead and get into that. I will talk about the selector later because the expression selector is a rabbit hole within itself, but we covered all of the properties and let's go ahead and move to the next section of this video. So before we get into our example, I'm going to quickly walk you through how range selectors can talk to one another. So this gives you a different look because a lot of tutorials you'll find on YouTube will just keep adding animators. But I do want to do one example of showing you how the range selector can give you some flexibility with your animations. So starting off with our example, you are the best in the biz. Everything is centered. We have our anchor point. Everything's good. We're going to go to animate and we're going to do two properties for this one. Position 
going to add one more, and that is going to be blur. All right, let's open up our range selector. For the first animation, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to keep it with square, but I am going to change it to words. But if we're using square, what do we need to use for our offset? We need to use 0 through 100, okay? So at the beginning, setting up my first keyframe at 0%, going to the one second mark, and I am going to go to 100%. All right. Now, the starting point, going back and putting my playhead to the front, where do we want this to start? I'm going to drag it down to, let's do like 250. All right, so we're going down. And the animation is going up. So there's our first animation. Now, I want it to start all blurry. So let's go ahead and change the blur. Do 350 like we did in our previous example. And now we should have something like this. If you want to smooth it out, you can also enable motion blur. So these are coming up. So that's our first one. But what if I instead, a lot of people will also do this, like what we demonstrated earlier is we'll copy those keyframes, we'll paste them, and then we will tell the program, all right, we want to time reverse these keyframes. So now we have the same animation coming in and then coming out, but we don't want that. Instead, what if we can have the animation be different? And that is what we'll do with an additional range selector. So. Go ahead and get rid of these keyframes. And let's keep in mind what is happening. Right now, our offset is ending. This is our destination, right? So we need to keep that in mind as we add our next range selector. So let's go to Add, Selector, Range. So now my animation isn't working because in our other range selector, if we open it up, we can see that our offset is at zero. So it's just starting at the starting point, but there's no animation happening. So since this ends at 100, we also need our second range selector to start at 100. So I'll move a little ahead in time so we can see it land as an animation. So our first offset is going to be 100. And now we have our animation back, right? Now it's there. Now we need it to animate out, but I want to use a different shape. That is the flexibility that we have with another range selector. So. If I wanted to use a different shape other than square, we need that parameter to be through what on our offset? 100 and negative 100. So I'm gonna go forward in time and I'm gonna choose ramp up and I'm going to change this. Oh, well, you know what? I'm gonna leave this to characters and then I'll smooth this out with 50, 50. And then what do we say? Since it's starting at 100, for our second range selector, we need it to end at negative 100. So it's going to serve as an animation out. So here we go. Word by word, square coming in, and then ramp up character by character. So this should give you an idea of what you can accomplish within one text layer with multiple range selectors. You can tell them to do different things. Now, let's go ahead and talk about how more animators can not only be maybe more flexible depending on what you're doing, but you can add and get more complex with your selections and with your animations. Let's go ahead and jump in. So the example from the Ali Abdal video is overshoot, position, rotate, and scale characters. So there's a lot of clues to what this is. So overshoot, more importantly, implies a delay, right? So position, it's moving up and it's overshooting. So we might actually have to move it up a little bit more so we get that effect. There seems to be not only scaling up, but a small scale here on the last part of the transition. And then we have rotate. So not only is it rotating in from the start, but it's also rotating a little bit at the end. So it looks like it's rotating and then coming back. All right, so there's a lot of clues there. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, I would usually build these one by one, and I'll show you kind of like my method of how I try to replicate other animations that I might see. So I'll go to animate, and I usually start with position because that's where most of the animation is going to start. But as we saw, we have all the parameters, and what is the shape that that reminded you of? Ramp up, right? So we already know from the get-go, okay, it's character by character. Now we're filling in all of these spaces before we even start. So let's go ahead and fill in those spaces. I'm gonna start with position. So our offset is easy. If we know that it's ramp up, we're gonna do negative 100. So we're not dealing with square. And we're gonna go to one second, and we're gonna go to 100. 
So we got our offset done. We have our animation done. It's going to go through the entire range. Now, we said ramp up, change it to ramp up. We want it to be nice and smooth. It was, it was pretty smooth. So I'm going to do 50 and 50 for both of these. So it's a nice, easy ease for the animation. And then let's go ahead and see where we're at as far as where the animation starts. So the position, I want it to come, I don't know, 200 pixels from where this destination is. So 200 pixels down. Go ahead and watch the animation. Not bad. Especially if you have motion blur on, it looks pretty good. So that's kind of the first part. Characters by characters. Okay, we got that right. What would be the next one? I think I want to do rotation. That sounds easy enough. So if I go to my starting point, let's see how we can change these. Let's do something kind of like 70 degrees or they're almost flat. See where that puts us. I think that's pretty good. So from here, what else would I do? We had position, rotate, and scale. They were all scaling in. Okay, so let's go ahead and add property scale. Let's do zero. We want it all to scale in. They're all ramping up. Okay, looking good. Now, let's work on the overshoot. I think we got that down. So for the overshoot, we need to add not only more parameters, but we need to add a delay. We can hit our animator or we can click on the layer itself with nothing else selected and we can add it from here, right? But I am just going to duplicate this animator. So we're working with all the same settings, kind of makes it a little bit faster. Control D. So all of the parameters are added that we already had. So it's an exact copy. We'll keep the offset the same for right now, but we need to do not only a little bit of math, but we need to change these. So we did want rotation and scale and position on these keyframes as well, but I'm going to put these at the default so they don't affect of what is on screen. So I'm resetting all of these and I'm just reminding myself what's happening here. Okay. So next we need to overshoot it. My rule of thumb for this when I do overshooting animations is I'm going to find the point of either the first letter or the first word. For this example, I'm going to stick with the first word, and that is U in this case. So if I go over to either the 15 or 16 frame mark, the 16 frame mark, I'm going to take these keyframes from our second animator, and I'm going to put it, and I'm going to start the first one there. Now for a proper delay, you want it to finish pretty fast after the initial uh, animator. So in this case, our first animator finishes at one. I'm gonna go at maximum five frames, but I'm gonna keep this at three frames for this example. So one, two, three, and I'm gonna drag over that keyframe. All right, so nothing's happening. Nothing's happening right now. Let's start with our animator. I'm going to turn off our second animator and just remind myself, okay, what's happening? Okay, everything's scaling in. We have, we have the position right and the rotating. So with this new animator, I need it to move up to overshoot. So I'm going to go the opposite direction. So in that case, let's do something like negative 30. So I'm going to turn off my first animator, turn on my second, and see what's happening with my second animator now. Make sure scale is at 100 so I can actually see it. There we go. So that is my second animator. So if I play my first one, have them play together, what do we got? Okay, pretty nice. I like that. They're overshooting and they're coming back down because we're creating that delay. Now for scale, we have them already scaling up, but I do want them to get bigger on this second animator. So I'm just going to make the initial scale bigger. Let's do 120. Okay. At the start, there it is. So now they're scaling up on that second animator and coming back down. That's pretty good. And you can make it even more drastic with like 150. This might look a little insane, but it's to show you what is happening, right? Pretty cool. I'm going to go back down to 120. So we need to have the rotation come in which is good, but we also need it to move a little bit more. So the first direction we were going was 70 degrees, but now we need to go the other direction. We need to go a little bit further the other way. So let's go 
negative 20. Where does that put us? That's not bad. Not bad at all. So I think this covers, we replicated what we saw on screen. Congratulations. Pat yourself on the back. We did it with two animators. So here you can add all the flair that you want with all the things that you just learned. For this example, I'm going to keep it real simple. I'm going to do property. Let's do fill color. It's going to be red. You know, it's going to fade in. Look at that. Boom. Nice. Okay. What else can we do? Well, I learned something called uh, a selector and we're doing We're going to do wiggly. Why not have these wiggle? So let's go to the wiggly selector. Already have some parameters here. Look how crazy this looks. Has a nice little animation that kind of bobbles in. Or you could go the other way, which is adding another animator to have everything wiggle. So if I take out this wiggly selector, I can now, let me just close both of these up so I don't get confused. What a lot of people will also do is they'll change the name. So you can rename these. So we'll do position one. And then you can type in what else you have in there. But just to show you that you can rename these. So animate, we're going to do position. And then this third animator, we're going to do a selector wiggly. And we're going to make it nice and subtle. We're going to go four frames on our X axis and five frames on our Y. And that should be a nice subtle effect. Look at that. Not bad, right? And then, of course, change all those settings that, that you learn. We make it real intense. So don't be afraid to add things. So say that I wanted to add some color, but I wanted the color to be randomized. Well, we already have the wiggly selector that randomizes things. So we can add what? Some color. So let's add some fill color, RGB. And guess what? Now we have color. And then you can change the color on your fill because right now the default is at uh, white. So if I change it to something else, this is going to affect the randomizer. So for my destination, I want it to be blue. And then you can already see the difference. So if I wanted to save this as a preset, this is exactly what you do. You select the transform in all of your animators. And then we're going to go to animation, save animation preset. So I'll just do walkthrough tutorial animation preset. Okay, everything's good. So if I start a new text layer, I'll just turn this off for now. Type in something new. Something new. Okay, I'm going to align this, control alt home, make sure it's definitely in the middle. And then guess what? I can go to my effects, window, effects and presets, animation presets, user presets, and we have our walkthrough tutorial preset. And before I drag and drop, just make sure your playhead is at the beginning because it's going to drop those keyframes. There we go. If you want to know how to use these in an actual editing workflow, please check out the video after this in this playlist. This playlist is going to be liquid. I want to have the most accurate and the most helpful tutorials on After Effects, Premiere Pro. Like that's what I'm striving for. And for all of these old tutorials that are out on YouTube, like I want to keep having not only accurate information, but the most helpful information possible to strap the people in this industry with some real skills and some real knowledge of, and, and to know like why they're making these decisions when they're in the editing room. That really means a lot to me. And I really appreciate everyone that has bought our products. It's been an absolute blast, like uploading and making content for people that have kind of bought into our ideology and how we see the community and how we see the industry at large. That really means a lot to us. So if you do want to check out our products, of course, that is linked down below. I'll be changing around a few things. We have some announcements coming up, but do let me know in the comments uh, what you thought about this video, if it was helpful, if it was too long, if, uh, if I missed something. But uh, I will be talking more about the range selector because again, I want your help with this and I want to have the most accurate information out there possible. And it's updated. It's actually new and it's actually helpful for other editors and creatives alike.
So with that being said, please do check out our homepage. I'm going to be having some unlisted videos where I talk about exactly where I am in the process of finding out all of the nuances that this effect does and what these tools can provide. So do check those out and do leave me a comment of what you have found and what discoveries you've made using this because I'm trying to soak up as much information and more importantly, I'm trying to figure out the why and how these tools work together. So all that being said, thank you all for tuning in. I'm Kyle with Saturn's Ring. I'll see you in the next one.